one of the reasons we focus on the breath. It's because we tend to breathe in lots of unskillful ways, causing ourselves a lot of unnecessary stress, tension. Because we focus on other issues, other concerns outside. that we become oblivious to how much tension we're carrying around in our bodies. And that tension gets maintained by our unskillful breathing. And as a result, we get desensitized to how much suffering we're experiencing, how much suffering we cause. And it spreads out to other people as well. We can often cause a lot of harm to other people without realizing it, because we're focusing on other issues. <clears throat> and sometimes it's pure selfishness, and sometimes we feel that actually we have to do and speak and think in certain ways. And we put up with the stress, and we put up the tension, because we think those ways are good, that there are the shoulds in our lives, the oughts in our lives. that we pick up, and many times pick up and without really thinking about them. Either ideas we picked up from other people, or ways we figured things out on our own. And so we carry around a lot of stress, without even realizing it. One of the purposes of the meditation is to resensitize ourselves. One, to how much stress is actually here right now, and two, to see ways that we can begin to let it go. In other words, stop creating it, stop carrying it around. And sometimes that involves just the mechanics of breathing. But you begin to notice very quickly as you're focusing on the breath. It's not just the physical side of the breathing, but there's a lot of mental activity that goes around the breathing as well. A lot of subconscious ideas about how the breath should come in, how you should feel the breathing. Tell, take anyone off the street and tell them, focus on your breath. They will immediately exaggerate the breathing process. They might align with whatever preconceived notions they have about how the breath should feel. That's one of the first things we have to learn to unlearn. Start questioning. Well, what is the breath? Is it the air coming in out of the lungs? Well, how does that come in and out of the lungs? What's going on in the body? Well, there's an energy flow. Try focusing on that. Which parts of the body have a smooth and unobstructed energy flow, which parts of the body feel obstructed, which parts can be totally cut off. Start looking around and asking questions. And you begin to see that a lot of the problems with focusing on the breath have to do with your concepts about the breathing, the mental pictures you carry. Just those pictures cause you unnecessary stress right here, right now. Say, so it's even not in front of your very nose, it's in your very nose, in your body. As you begin to settle down and get more attuned to how the breathing process can feel in the body, how it can be used to work through different patterns of tension, you begin to run into other mental issues as well. And these will vary from person to person, ideas that you carry around. I remember when I was first staying with the John Fuhr, 3 a.m., we had the bombers going over from Utapau Air, Air Base. They were going over to bomb Cambodia. 
I got to wonder, here I am sitting on this hillside, not doing anything to help the human race. This horrible war is going on. So I talked about it to John Fuhr. He said, well, how much of the human race can you carry around before your own goodness breaks? What are the shoulds in your life, in other words, that you really have to listen to? And which are the ones, the false shoulds that you're carrying around? And there's really nothing I could have done to stop the war. But one area I could be responsible for was how I touched the lives of the people around me. And what's needed to touch them in a good and useful way. And I began to realize I had a lot of unexamined ideas about this. When I went back and reordained, I'd say it took me the whole first year to sort through those ideas about where my responsibilities lay. And how I could live in a way that was free and yet responsible. And that was just that one year was just based around the, the really obvious blatant issues I was carrying. There are other lessons I have to learn. Which is why you notice when the Buddha teaches the Dharma, he doesn't teach just about sitting with your eyes closed or meditating. Lots of lists, lots of perspectives, both in the Dharma and in the Vinaya, about what we owe to one another. And the best way of looking after our responsibilities towards one another. After all, gratitude is a large issue in the practice. That was one thing that struck me immediately. Even though Theravada has this reputation for being selfish, I remember my first week with Ajahn Fu, the issue of gratitude to your parents came up again and again and again. Gratitude towards anyone who has helped you. It's a passage in the canon that says that's the sign of a good person. Well, how do you repay the debt that you owe to other people? One is to live in a totally harmless way, which means you have to find your happiness inside. Develop a sense of center, a sense of strength inside. So that you can look after your own needs. Not constantly have to be leading in other people, at least not leading more than you have to. This way, when someone else has issues, you can look at their issues with a lot more objectivity. Because you're not trying to feed off of that person. You've learned how to feed inside. You've learned how to provide food, clothing, shelter, medicine for the mind inside. And that way you can actually be more present for the other person. So as we practice here, it's not simply looking after ourselves. As we look after our minds, we also begin to you know, so we can be more effective in helping other people too. And for some of us, that really changes the dynamic of how we relate to others. But it requires questioning not only our concepts of how the breath moves in the body, but also our concepts of how we deal with other people, what our responsibilities are. What's what the best way to meet those responsibilities? As you get more and more sensitive to how 
unnecessary burdens you create for yourself happen, how you maintain them, and also how you can let them go. You'll also learn about how you can be less burdensome to others, actually more helpful to others. In a genuine way. Some of the idea of our responsibilities to others will involve att attachment, taking on their sorrows, which doesn't really help them. What is helpful is learning how to keep your mind balanced and solid inside. So you can see this situation more clearly. What needs to be done, what doesn't need to be done. Where in the past you've been leaning on other people without realizing it. In the same way that you've been carrying stress around in your body without realizing it. As you get more sensitive inside, you get more sensitive outside as well. So in that way your generosity to others does become more genuine generosity. The help you give to others becomes genuine help. It really does help them. So as we practice, we're calling into question a lot of ideas we've been carrying around. We hold on to the breath, get ourselves sensitive to the breath as a way of giving ourselves something solid to hold on to as we question these other things, these other ideas. To see where sometimes what we thought was help was actually a burden. And how genuine help doesn't have to be burdensome for either side. This is when the Buddha's aunt, Mahavajapati, asked him for some short and simple teachings on the Dharma. And one of the principles the Buddha laid out was if there's a teaching that causes you to be burdensome, then it's not the Dharma. If there's a teaching that helps you to be unburdensome, and that means unburdensome to yourself and to other people. That is the genuine Dhamma. So keep this point in mind. We, we carry lots of burdens around. If you can take a snapshot of most people's minds, they're all bent over, carrying huge burdens which they don't have to. Or in a John Lee's image of the person who's tied with a rope to his neck to a post in front of him and a rope to his waist to a post behind him, his right hand tied to a post to the right, his left hand tied to a post to his left. And as these posts get moved around, you get jerked around as well. So when you can learn how to cut those burdens, cut those ropes that tie you down, that's when you can stand tall. When you stand tall, you can see what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. And even with issues that do have to be done, you learn how to treat them in a way that's not burdensome. So this is an important aspect of training the mind, is looking for those unnecessary burdens and ask yourself, why do you feel you need to carry them around? Learn how to question those ideas. Even the burdens you think are necessary, you're going to have to learn how to question as well. So when everything is questioned like this, where do you stand? What to be when you stand right here at the breath? Always do your best to keep the breath calm, at least so that it feels good throughout the body. Sometimes it might be heavy breathing feels good, whatever. But stay in touch with your breathing.
bring as much awareness to the process as you can. You find that it gives you a good, solid foundation. 